Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 62 of the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. This week, we're going to be starting with the eyeball. My name is Brian Wallace. I'm the host and creator here at Physician Assistant Exam Review, and you can find all of the notes and everything you could need to get ready for your exam over at the website, www.physicianassistantexamreview.com. Uh, everything's searchable over there. It's really convenient and easy to use. Uh, so that's a great place to go get started. We are starting a whole new topic today. We're going to be covering uh, the eyeball for starters, and then we're going to move through EENT. Last episode, we had an amazing episode where we brought Elena on, our very first guest ever at Physician Assistant Exam Review, and she absolutely knocked it out of the park. I thought that was just fantastic. The feedback on that episode uh, has been great. She's gotten a lot of, uh, made a lot of contacts, been helping a lot of people, which is phenomenal. And, and, and the other great part about this is I had a lot of people reach out to me and say, hey, I'm in the same position as Elena. I would love to help. So I've been stockpiling a list of email addresses. So again, if you know someone who needs somebody to talk to, if you know someone who's failed their exam, if God forbid you fail your exam, uh, please reach out to me, let me know. And I definitely have some people now that I can put you in contact with who are interested in helping, interested in talking with you about your struggles because it, it can be very isolating, very lonely. So that's a great episode. If you missed that one, certainly go back and listen to it. It is not just for people who have failed their exam. It's definitely, uh, Elena has shared some amazing ideas on how to get ready for your exam, what she misthought, what she didn't understand beforehand, and how she grew and got better and had a better focus. So definitely, if you have not listened to that episode, episode 61, definitely go back and give that one a listen. It is fantastic. And I'm hoping maybe uh, if you guys give me some feedback on this, whether or not I should, uh, you know, just from time to time, bring in some other guests, talk to some other people about some different topics. If you have some uh, like I said, if you have feedback on that, just shoot me an email. Or uh, if you have an idea for someone who you'd like to have on the show, maybe that's something that I could start doing. I do think that uh, maybe maybe something of interest uh, to you and to me. So uh, we'll talk, have we'll keep that discussion line open as we move forward. So, all right. So anyway, today we are going to pick up with the eyeball. We're going to go get started on this section. There's, it, I sort of broke it up into four or five shows. There's there's a bit of information, and part of the key is keeping an idea as to which parts go with which parts, uh, how to separate stuff out, how to understand test questions and see how they're going to be asking that stuff. It's something I've been focusing on with you more and more uh, recently. Um, so just keep that stuff in mind as we move forward. And it's a lot of where these priming question ideas come from and where the questions in the final step come from is, is what's going to be most important. How are they going to separate out on your test? What do you need to know? As always, this show is not necessarily designed for clinical practice. It's just not my focus. My focus is on getting you to practice the test. Does that mean it doesn't help in clinical practice? No, of course it does. Uh, but that's not the focus of this show. This show is designed to get you to understand test taking, to understand answering questions, and to get you to understand how the questions get written and what they're shooting for so that you can pass your exam uh, the first time around, hopefully. And if not then, then certainly the second time around. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our priming questions for today. Which is more fleshy and which is more vascular when discussing pinguecula and pterygium? Which is more fleshy and which is more vascular when discussing pinguecula and pterygium? Those are two that I always struggled with separating. A dendritic ulcer on a slit lamp exam should make you think of what diagnosis? A dendritic ulcer on a slit lamp exam should make you think of what diagnosis? And our last one is viral conjunctivitis more likely bilateral or unilateral is bilateral. I'm sorry. Is viral conjunctivitis more likely bilateral or unilateral? All right. So that's a great place for us to get started. Things that, for you to keep an eye out for as we move along through today's topic. So we're going to start with the eyeball. Um, we are going to start with disorders of the conjunctiva today. We are going to do some disorders of the cornea, and that'll wrap us up uh, for this section. So we're going to start with bacterial and viral conjunctivitis. Uh, and we'll start with viral conjunctivitis. So the causes here, it's usually adenovirus. It can be lots of different things, but adenovirus 3, 8, and 19 seem to come up more frequently than others. And this is highly contagious. So that's a big key to this one. It's highly contagious. Clinical presentation, this is, has acute onset and watery discharge from the eyes. Usually this is bilateral. Usually viral conjunctivitis is bilateral. And you can remember that because it's so very, very contagious. It jumps from one eye to the other very quickly. One of the factors with clinical presentation here is one of the signs that comes up is ipsilateral 
preauricular lymphadenopathy with a viral conjunctivitis. And I could just see that being included in the test question and screwing you up because you're, you're wondering whether or not that's important. And uh, it's, it's just an extra sign you can remember here. And often these patients will have photophobia. Labs and studies, this really doesn't require much as far as labs and studies go. It's a typically a clinical diagnosis. Treatment here, well, we start with prevention, right? We want frequent hand washing, frequent disinfection. That's how we keep this from spreading, and we want education. So whenever my kids get off the bus, whenever they get home, they wash their hands. When they go to school, they wash their hands. One of the keys to keeping this from spreading is hand washing, disinfection, and making sure that the kids know how you get this. This is, tends to be self-limiting. So it's just kind of gross for a little bit, but it's not a big deal. You can use cool or warm compresses to the eye for symptomatic relief. And a severe case, you can use topical steroids, although obviously that's for a more severe case. The contrast to viral conjunctivitis is bacterial conjunctivitis. Causes here, obviously, it depends on the organism, and it's transmitted through direct contact or contact with a contaminated object. So touching a contaminated object and touching your eyeball. And this doesn't seem like something you do a lot unless you start paying attention and realize how often you're rubbing your eyes throughout the day. Uh, so it certainly is a, uh, a hand washing issue. Strep pneumonia, Staph aureus, Haemophilus, Moraxella, those are all bugs that can cause this. Chlamyd Chlamydia is a little more rare, but definitely more severe. And then um, you can also have a Neisseria infection, but in that case, you're going to be thinking about their sexual partners and what's going on there. Clinical presentation. This has more of an acute onset of purulent discharge. So again, we're just going to kind of contrast this with our viral conjunctivitis. This is That was watery. This is purulent, right? So we got kind of goopy yuck coming out here. They have significant edema in these cases. And these start unilaterally, although they can be bilateral. They're not quite as contagious as the viral conjunctivitis tend to be. So you usually only get it in one eye, although it certainly can be spread to the second eye. And this is the one where you wake up in the morning and your eye feels all stuck shut and you can't open it and you're trying and you think you're going blind and then you realize, oh no, I've got pink eye. Labs and studies, typically this is a clinical diagnosis as well. You can, if you want to, uh, if you're concerned, you can get a gram stain to identify the bacteria if it doesn't respond to the to your antibiotics. Um, if you think it might be chlamydia, you're going to want to get a Gimsa stain. If you think it's Neisseria, you need to do a culture on chocolate agar. That's the one thing to keep in mind for Neisseria is a little bit different. A treatment here, just like our viral conjunctivitis, you're going to want to worry first about preventative measures. So frequent hand washing, disinfection, and education. After that, it's going to be a topical antibiotic, moxifloxacin, 0.5% drops for three days, is one of the antibiotics that comes up frequently for this. Chlamydia and Neisseria are going to require oral antibiotics. The topical isn't going to get the job done. So that seems to be ceftriaxone, one gram IM, along with azithromycin, one gram orally, and this that one dose of each. All right, disorders of the cornea. So that was disorders of the conjunctivus. So really it's just those two infections. We have a viral infection and we have a bacterial infection. Um, one we need to treat with antibiotics, one we treat, uh, we basically just let it ride and it self clears. Disorders of the cornea. Number one here, we have cataracts. This is an opacification of the lens obstructing the flow of light to the retina. So the lens gets cloudy. That's really what this boils down to. Causes and risk factors. There's a whole bunch of them here. Um, but I think this is an easy thing to ask questions on. So aging is definitely one. You get denaturation of proteins over time in that lens. And just as you get older, this is a, is a common issue for people as they age. Trauma can cause some issues with the proteins in the lens. Sunlight and radiation exposure can certainly cause cataract development. I still remember there was a, there's a test question on risk factors or something along those lines for development of cataracts. And the answer choice was sunglasses. And I forget what I picked, but I remember being angry about it and then realizing that uh, sunlight and radiation exposure are certainly risk factors for developing cataracts. So that's one to keep an eye on just because I think it's, again, it's such an easy test question to write. Uh, genetic predisposition, of course. Uh, smoking can increase your risks of cataracts, steroid use. And then systemic diseases like diabetes can also increase your risk for cataracts. So I would definitely know 
my risk factors. I think just think it's a, it makes a lot of sense. It's super easy to write questions on. Clinical presentation, the patients will come in with difficulty seeing in low light. And then they have a slow, progressive, cloudy vision. So over time, they almost don't even notice it initially. But over time, it gets worse and worse and more cloudy and more cloudy, and they have more and more trouble seeing in less and less light. So a slit lamp is used to confirm the diagnosis, with dial, uh, dilate the pupils, and that's how we diagnose a cataract, because you can see it. Treatment. Prevention is going to be key here. Again, like I said earlier, risk factors and knowing how to prevent it. Sunglasses for ultraviolet filtering, quit smoking, that kind of stuff will help to reduce the incidence of cataracts. And then once you have cataracts, behavior modifications are going to help with vision. So if you get glasses with the proper prescription, that's going to help. If you improve lighting, that's going to help. Using up a magnifying lens, that's going to help. None of that obviously will reverse the process or get rid of the cataract, but the, the real problem is you can't see, right? So if we can do some of these things to increase your ability to see, then certainly that helps. And then lastly, of course, we have surgery. We can remove the cataract and replace and put in a replacement lens. All right, pterygium and pinguecula comes up next. So the pterygium is a benign wedge-shaped growth of conjunctiva. It is very vascular and may grow over the cornea. This is more common in sunny, hot, dry climates, and it's caused by constant irritation. So you're thinking about places that are very windy, places with a lot of sun and sand exposure. Um, so it's, it's basically a constant ir irritation of the eye that causes this growth. Treatment, artificial tears can help, and it, it really doesn't cause a major problem, although it can grow over the cornea. Uh, typically, it does not and it's more just kind of gross looking. So if you want to have it removed, it's not difficult. It can be surgically removed, uh, especially if it's irritating or becomes a visual problem, but it doesn't need to be removed. Pinguecula is very similar, um, which is part of the problem in telling them apart. This one's actually not on the blueprint, although I would still make sure I could tell them apart because, again, even though it's not there, it just feels like a, a low-hanging fruit as far as test question writing goes. Um, and this is a white or yellowish deposit on the conjunctiva. This typically does not grow over the cornea, Risk factors here are similar. Um, it's that chronic irritation, that wind, sun exposure, uh, sand exposure, dry, hot climates. And here again, even less so, no treatment is necessary, but it can be surgically removed. So this, like I said, the pinguecula typically will not grow over. It is a little bit, it is more, uh, it, it's a, It's a. I think I used the term earlier, a flesh, more fleshy growth. So it's a white or yellowish deposit where the, the pterygium is a more vascular growth. It's a little bit thinner, but it grows a little bit more. And again, that's just secondary to that constant irritation. Treatment. Again, oh, I think I just said this. No treatment's necessary, uh, but it may, may be a problem. The next section in the blueprint is a little bit funny. It has keratitis and corneal ulcer or ulcerative keratitis separated out. Um. And keratitis is a corneal infection. So ulcerative keratitis is a corneal infection with an ulcer. So the bacteria or the bug causes an ulcer on the cornea. It's rare to see a keratitis without an ulcer. So I'm going to zip through that one pretty quick. So it may be caused by herpes, Lyme disease, Epstein-Barr, or syphilis are the ones that jump out. Clinical presentation varies depending on the agents, but usually you get photophobia, pain, blurry vision. On a slit lamp exam, it'll show some cloudiness of the cornea. And if you do a blood test, that's how you can get, um, you can figure out what the, the virus is that's causing this. Treatment is going to be referred to an ophthalmologist and topical steroids may be necessary here to keep it under control. But from for what I think it's worth, keratitis itself just as a separate topic, uh, not something you should see a ton of. I, at least I don't think so. Corneal ulcer with ulcerative keratitis, or <clears throat> excuse me, or ulcerative keratitis. So this gets, I guess it just gets a little bit confusing, uh, but this is a in infection of the cornea with an ulcer. So it gets a little bit of a, of, a, of a lesion on there. And this is secondary to infection most of the time. So you get bacterial, which is staph, strep, E. coli, or pseudomonas. And this is what you're a little bit more used to hearing about. Or you can get viral keratitis, which is usually herpes. And then you can also get fungal keratitis. 
clinical presentation, this is extremely painful eyeballs, tearing, vision loss, redness, and it feels like there's a foreign body in your eye. It's just very, uh, like I said, painful, irritating, all that stuff. Labs and studies. You also, you're going to use the slit lamp to diagnose this. And then you can also use a fluorescein stain to help visualize the ulcer. So it's that greenish stain. And if you look up, uh, it's pretty easy to find. The big one here is the dendritic ulcer. And that always used to drive me crazy because uh, I just, I don't know why I didn't get it. And it's pretty, it's actually really, really simple. The dendritic ulcer on the eye is, it's all of these things cause an, an ulcer, right? So a lesion on the eye. A dendritic ulcer just looks like a dendrite or looks like a little branched tree when you look at it. And this is indicative of herpes, of a herpes infection. And again, that's just such an easy one that I see test questions on all the time. Uh, dendritic ulcer equals herpes infection uh, in a ulcerative keratitis. You can do corneal scrapings for a gram stain or KOH prep. And then once again, treatment depends on the causative agent. So it depends on what you're covering, uh, what you're trying to get at, right? So we have for a bacterial infection it requires appropriate antibiotic therapy. Fungal infection requires intense topical treatment. Viral, viral infections require topical antiviral. And you may need to have surgical repair of the ulcer depending on how bad it is. All right, so that's a quick run through of corneal issues and uh, conjunctival issues. And we'll start off our discussion for the eyeball. And that'll wrap us up for that content for today. I think it's a really good place to start. And I'm excited to be getting through uh, some of this stuff into season two. I'm, I'm really excited about what we've covered so far and where we're heading. Uh, the study tip for today is going to be very, very straightforward and a little self-serving. Uh, my study tip for today is to go ahead and, and make sure that you get the February issue of the Physician Assistant Exam Scholars newsletter. Uh, this may be the most important newsletter that I've put out so far. It has some content on test taking that you are not going to find anywhere else, that you have not seen anywhere else, uh, and is really the difference maker for me when it comes to taking exams. It's what takes somebody from struggling and not knowing how to get through their exams and being frustrated and anxious as they go through their tests to being a rock star. It takes some practice. It's not super straightforward. Uh, but what I cover in this, in the February issue of the Physician Assistant Exam Scholars newsletter is absolutely what's led me to as much success as I have had taking exams uh, and makes it so that I can go in with a clear head, uh, be comfortable, and know that I'm going to do the best job I can. And it usually turns out that way. Uh, so definitely go ahead and get over to the website and get your hands on that. I think that's going to be uh, a game changer for a lot of people. Like I said, this may be the most important issue that I have written. Uh, and I've on I think this issue 22 or 23. Either way, I've been doing this for two years now. And this one is something that I think is just is, is incredibly important. So go ahead over to the website and check that out at www.physicianassistantexamreview.com. All right, so let's finish up with our uh, priming questions and get the answers for those. Which is more fleshy and which is more vascular when discussing pinguecula and pterygium? Pterygium was the more vascular one and pinguecula is more fleshy. Again, I would just try to keep those separate in my mind somehow. Just hold on to those two. A dendritic ulcer on a slit lamp exam should make you think of what diagnosis. Hopefully this went off with alarm bells when you saw it because this one, like I said, pops up all the time. A very straightforward herpes simplex. And this is all the way back to the beginning. Is viral conjunctivitis more likely bilateral or unilateral? Viral conjunctivitis, how do we separate them out? And the answer is bilateral. It's very contagious. It jumps from one eye to the other pretty readily. So be aware of that. As you uh, go through this material, always be thinking about and compared to what, compared to what, how are we separating this stuff out? That'll wrap us up for today, season two, episode 62, the beginning of the eyeball. Very excited to get me moving forward with this. Uh, next time, we're just going to be moving right through the eyeball and covering more and more there and getting you ready for your exam. Uh, until then, head over to the website, www.physicianassistantexamreview.com to find anything else that you're going to need and definitely sign up for the email list. I think you're really going to get a lot out of what I have for you over there. All right, take care.